I'm very glad to be able to be interviewing Steve Holt about uh, various subjects and uh, he would like to talk about uh, a comparison or a discussion concerning two, two things. One is uh, Ellie Goldratt's Stigler Constraints and the other one is Dave Snowden's Kinnan, uh, Cunevin, sorry, uh, the spelling is here and you'll understand why it's always difficult to remember how you say it because it's Welsh. Uh, anyway, so tell me what uh, what is your point of view on, on these things and how they how they meet up. So I, in in studying theory of constraints, uh, we we know that that TFC uh, is a way to handle dependencies and uncertainty and variation. And I thought about that, and I thought if you're if you're planning a, a major project. Um, how do you actually know? How can I walk in and say, I'm going to build this bridge and it's going to take me four years to do it and it's going to cost precisely this many millions of dollars? Like, how can you possibly know that? Mm -hmm. How can you can't predict what's going to happen? Uh, there might be socio political statements, there might be extreme weather conditions. It, you're really, in a way, you. You are pretending as if you have this certain path, mm. but the reality is you're, you're charting unknown waters. Absolutely. Right? Mm. And so I, I started thinking about this and thinking, well, what else is out there on how to handle uncertainty? And, you know, there are things like uh, Monte Carlo methods where you say, we'll just do a, uh, enough simulations and we'll just, we'll predict what's going to happen. Well, that's, that's not really true. It, gives you an indication of what might happen, but that's not it either. And I, I had the good fortune uh, to run across the, the Kinevin framework uh, after one of my friends had taken a, a cognitive edge workshop from Dave Snowden. And as he described it, it just made a lot of sense to me. And I saw it as a way that uh, I could actually it also helped me with this this great dilemma. Um, when we would look at things like lean methodologies or TOC methodologies, mm -hmm. there's this thing I've, I've sometimes referred to as the goal syndrome. And it's people who say, oh, I know all about TOC because I've read the goal. It's about finding Herbie in the factory. Mm -hmm. And... <clears throat> And you say, well, we're going to apply it here in the office. And they said, well, no, it doesn't apply in the office. And, and, and it, it, we get into tool wars, right? And, or we'll have a TLC person talking to a lean person, and they're both talking about flow, but they don't realize it because they're using different terms. Absolutely. Right? And, and I realized that within the Kinevin framework, mm -hmm. I could look at the different domains, and I could say, well, it's obvious, and we all agree, in this domain, these are the type of methods and tools that apply. And in this other domain, it would be these other ones. And one of the things you realize rather rapidly is um, most of the existing methodologies in the world exist extremely well for what's called the simple or obvious domain, mm -hmm. or for the complicated domain. Very, very few of them work in the complex domain. Mm -hmm. One of the few exceptions being a number of TOC methodology. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that we have buffer management gives us an enhanced ability to deal with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not perfect. Sure. Uh, there's, always a, there's always a domain of complexity that you'll never know. Mm -hmm. uh, but it gives us a much better right. Now, related to this then is Goldratt began talking about inherent simplicity, mm -hmm. and it. I had to really think about what it is he was saying because it sounded as if he said, if I look at a complex system and I look at it long enough, I can in, I can discover an element of inherent simplicity such that it will become in a Kinevin simple domain system. Mm -hmm. And I realized that's, that's actually not 
what Goldratt was saying. He was really saying, I can find a control mechanism that will allow me to cope with an inherently complex system in a way that actually is, I, I can navigate my way through it. That, that produces similar results through as if you were uh, in, in a simple system. It's, it's certainly more predictable. Uh, you know, you can't, in a, in a business environment, uh, you just simply aren't allowed to throw your arms up and say, I just don't know what to do, it's complex. Well, you're not allowed to, but quite a few people do. They do, right? right? Or what they do is they just make flat out guesses about what to do. Yeah. Or they go with the tried and true approaches of just give me more people and money. Yeah, or they move around sort of Brownian motion according to the yes, latest Yes, I, I actually loved that concept yeah. the other day of Brownian motion. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and those aren't really management. Those are, those are almost like management by luck. As you say, it's more like not management. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and so I, I said, well, what what is it we're actually allowed to do now? Uh, Dave Snowden has talked about the 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 use of uh, boundaries mm -hmm. or barriers mm -hmm. or modulators, which which nudge the system into a direction that you want. So mm -hmm. you can never say, I'm going to have it set up so exactly this thing happens. But I can encourage it to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. And so many of the things that we do in TOC are actually set up to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, throughput accounting systems encourage us to do things that are appropriate as opposed to conventional accounting, mm -hmm. which discourage yeah. the right things, right? Yeah. Buffer management encourage us to put priority. When we say uh, use full kit, use buffer management, follow a prioritization system, don't multitask. All of those are ways to give us a sense of focus mm -hmm. and cut down on the amount of controllable complexity, right? Now, we will always have emergent events. Mm -hmm. um, discussion the other day on aircraft maintenance, uh, last night's presentation, there's planned events yeah and then there's things that just happen right um, I, I I was convinced there was a quote in a Robert Heinlein book years ago and I, I've never been able to find it and prove to myself that it was actually Heinlein yeah. but we said the quote said I'm not afraid of the bullet that has my name on it because that's fate and there's nothing that can be done about it mm -hmm. but I'm going to do my best to avoid the ones marked to whom it may concern <laughs> Okay. And I think that what we do with a lot of the the basic principles in TLC, mm. we remove a lot of the to whom it may concern things. Yeah. Uh, I was talking to a person once in a critical chain implementation, and, and he said when he first started doing buffer management, initially there seemed to be many more problems than there ever had been before. And he said it was like he was driving down a road at night and there were potholes and there were animals and there were tree branches and he was rocks and he was having to avoid driving all around them. Where before, he would be driving down the same road that had the same obstacles on it. Mm -hmm. But now it was very foggy. And so he could only see what was directly in front of him. So all of the barriers were there, yeah. but now we could see them and avoid them. Um, I like that. Yeah. And I always felt that was a, a good analogy. It's like, and it fits in with this idea of TLC providing focus. Okay. And um, you also said that thinking about uh, these, these two views, uh, it gave you insights into inherent, Eddie Goldratt's inherent simplicity? When, when Goldratt talked about inherent simplicity, uh, if you really read very deeply what he talks about in The Choice, yeah. he, he, I think sometimes people get the impression that he's, he's advocating that if you find this, this, this magic gem then suddenly everything will be simple, right? Yeah. And, and the answer will be obvious. 
in front of you. That's not what he really describes. He, he talks about the need for experimentation and the need for the scientific method mm -hmm. and to think like a scientist. Now, what he's really talking about, he's talking about experimentation. Mm -hmm. And m many times he would say, right, I'm going to try this first. Don't any of you, rest of you, try it because it might not work. I'll try it first because then if it, it, it may not work, mm -hmm. right? And this gets back to Efrat's question about don't you feel bad when something doesn't work? Right? Yeah. Well, that's an example of I ran an experiment. I got the results. They were different than I expected. So now I have to stop and think, what might be the reason for that? What mm -hmm. other experiment can I run? And until eventually you put something together and say, ah, I think I have the answer now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try another experiment. This is what I predict will happen. And if you get to the point where that, that is the prediction, mm -hmm. that's the point then when we can turn that into something like a, a full thinking process analysis, mm -hmm. which now explains why that method works. And so we'll, you know, within TLC, we might come up with a new breakthrough idea, and maybe the first time the most of the community, first muster of the community sees it, is when a thinking process analysis is presented to them. Mm -hmm. Well, that gives people the perception that that's how it was created. Yeah. And it's not. That's mm -hmm. just how it was documented. Yeah. And, and I think the, the, the thinking process is a superb uh, way to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but very often it requires uh, this flash of insight Absolutely. to be able to do the ex experiments. Yeah. No, you're right. The, 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 now, the innovation or the flash of insight uh, is needs to be added to, to the to the tools because otherwise you're yeah you're not going to now get the full many sense of it. most people require multiple experiments. That's why yeah. uh, the Kinevan framework really advocates multiple safe to fail experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, small experiments, a week long, mm -hmm. two weeks long, mm -hmm. very little money. If it doesn't work, there's no harm, yeah. you know. Uh, so, some sometimes it's more difficult to do that than others. Sometimes, <laughs> it's a big experiment, and then I think that's where where Goldratt was coming from. Is some of what he did was relatively big experiments, yeah. And he wanted to make sure that n nobody else uh, took the blame if they didn't work. That's good point. Okay, well, thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. Thank you.